Chapter 3. A Theology of Pacifism and the Sermon on the Mount. A Biblical Look at the Use of Force. Biblical Pacifism? A Christian doctrine of force is easily discovered both in the Scriptures and in the record of the Church's interpretation of the Scriptures. Godly force restricted the onslaught of Muslim swords against defenseless Christians. Godly force was exercised by Cortes in conquest of the Aztecs and their satanic practice of human sacrifice. Godly force was used to stop the Nazis. Force, even lethal force, is not only commanded by God and performed by Him on innumerable occasions in the older scriptures. It is also prescribed in the law for citizens' participation. When a man sacrificed his own children to a false god, the whole community was obligated to participate in an execution by stoning. Leviticus 20, 2-4 Use of lethal force is not only commanded as a judicial act, but granted to the individual in cases of self-defense or the defense of others. The example of the thief breaking in at night, see Exodus 22, 2, teaches that he, whose crime, theft, is not a capital offense, may be killed justifiably if he is stealing from someone at night by breaking into a house. There is no blood guilt because the possibility of threat of death or harm vindicates the man who protects himself with lethal force. The fact that homicide is justifiable for the prevention of murder is consistent with the principle of judicial capital punishment, which is prescribed for murderers in the very rudiments of God's instructions for society. Genesis 9.6 if death is the penalty for killing the innocent, how much more appropriate to protect the innocent, even by the use of lethal force against the perpetrator? Also noteworthy is the inclusion of men of force in the parade of heroes honored in the faith chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. Samson, Gideon, and David are mentioned. Verse 32. By faith, it is said, they conquered kingdoms, and became mighty in war. Verses 33-34. All these, it is said, quote, gained approval through their faith. Verses 2 and 39. They applied force faithfully, according to the good pleasure of the one who teaches the hands of his faithful, quote, to war. Psalm 144-1. When the Lord Jesus was transfigured before his disciples, he appeared in glory in the presence of two giants among the saints of old, Moses and Elijah. Moses, that deliverer of God's people at whose hand great violence was brought upon the oppressors of God's people. Elijah's finest hour was his bloody victory at Mount Carmel, where to the glory of God he put hundreds of false prophets to death with his sword. Jesus shunned no man of righteous force. Neither the life of Christ nor his teachings abolish the law regarding godly force. Jesus of Nazareth came in humiliation to die. Yet even in that role, he had occasion to act forcefully. His action in the temple is illustrative of godly force. It was not once but twice that he cleansed it. The first time was at the inauguration of his ministry, John chapter 2, 13 through 22. The event is recorded only by John. It says he made a scourge and threw animals and people out of the temple. Then he dumped the tables of money over and warned the people against defiling the father's house. The second cleansing occurred during his last public ministry in Jerusalem. On the way, he passed a fig tree with no fruit. In this, he shows his very godly attitude with reference to the judgments from the Old Testament God toward the fruitless. Jesus pronounced judgment upon the hapless tree. He then proceeded into Jerusalem. In the temple, he threw out the bankers, turned over the tables, blocked access, apparently, to the temple, and explained that he was angry over the issue of disrespect in God's temple. Mark 11, 15-21 we are given here an insight into the character of Christ, which may seem contradictory to his passive response to the injustice of his own trial and execution. He is zealous, he is zealous for righteousness. 
for justice, even as he is full of mercy. As he approaches his ultimate expression of mercy, his substitutionary atonement for the sins of the world, he retains his zeal for righteousness. Whether these attributes are felt by God in varying degrees at different times and places suggests, again, the matter of role and times and seasons with respect to God's actions in history. And there are, in this principle, ramifications for God's people. There is a time to kill, to protect oneself and others, and there is a time to suffer and die voluntarily. In another passage, the account of Jesus commanding his disciples to take swords with them illumines both the continuity of the biblical teaching on legitimate force and the principle of role distinction discussed above. Just prior to being taken by the authorities in the garden, Jesus gave instructions to the disciples which differed from the assignment he had given them when he first commissioned them. See Matthew 10, 1-14 and Luke 22, 35-38. At the outset of their ministries, the disciples, now commissioned as apostles, Matthew 10, 2, were given a special assignment which included miraculous feats. Heal the sick, raise the dead. They were to travel lightly, acquiring no wealth, but gariously staying in homes along the way. Those households which showed no hospitality were reckoned to have incurred judgment upon themselves. But as the ministry of Christ was drawing to a close, Jesus recalled the former instructions, Luke 22:35, and then gave the apostles new instructions. But now let him who has a purse take it along, likewise also a bag, and let him who has no sword sell his robe and buy one. Verse 36. They answered, Lord, look, here are two swords. Christ replied, It is enough. The apostles were to anticipate resuming a different style of ministry, which would include the common methods of self-defense. The instructions, according to Barnes, have reference to their future life, not to the imminent arrest at Gethsemane. The time of the trial in Gethsemane was just at hand, nor was there time then, if no other reason existed, to go and make the purchase. It altogether refers to their future life. They were going into the midst of dangers. The country was infested with robbers and wild beasts. It was customary to go armed. He tells them of those dangers, of the necessity of being prepared in the usual way to meet them. The common preparation for that manner of life consisted in money, provisions, and arms. All, therefore, that the passage justifies is, first, that it is proper for men to provide beforehand for their wants and for ministers and missionaries as well as any others. Second, that self-defense is lawful. Men encompassed with danger may lawfully defend their lives. The burden of proof is upon those who would deny that force can be applied morally. In view of the fact that Christ himself used force even while functioning in his passive role of suffering servant, and that he specifically instructed his disciples to do that which was normal in terms of preparation for their own defense, the burden is great. Moreover, the weight of church history and tradition makes the burden unbearable. We must examine, nevertheless, the claims of those who argue for pacifism or non-resistance. Historically, Pacifism finds no place in creeds until the Reformation and the ensuing Anabaptist confessions. There were always ascetic groups like heterodox Montanists, second century, or the evangelistic anti-worldly Waldenses, 13th century, who championed poverty and preaching. But the pacifism of these mystic Christians was an aspect of a theology of separation from the world and the absence of Christians in military service in the first three centuries is explained more by mandatory oaths to the divine emperor and the general hostility of the state to Christianity than by Christian doctrinal objections to participation in war. See Luke chapter 3, 14 through 15. The Anabaptist Schleitheim Confession, 1527, was developed by the Swiss Brethren. The sixth article against the use of the sword appealing to the story of the woman caught in adultery and the general disinvolvement involvement of Christians in the affairs which belonged to worldly princes.
The seventh article prohibits oaths because of a passage in the Sermon on the Mount. We shall examine the sermon below. Similarly, the Dordrecht Confession of 1632 in Germany prohibited the use of, quote, the sword and the swearing of oaths, appealing again to the Sermon on the Mount. From these Anabaptists descend the Moravians, Mennonites, Hutterites, and others who have historically maintained separatist communities and participated neither in war nor government. The doctrinal position of pacifists is useful to examine because some of the same biblical texts are summoned by opponents of the use of force to stop abortion. However, from the outset it is important to note some distinctions. One can be a pacifist and consistently object to using force to stop abortion. However, one can also be a non-pacifist with regard to war, a subscriber to the historic just war theory, and yet oppose the use of defensive force by an individual to defend another person, strange as all this may sound. The pursuit of true justice and mercy cannot preclude forceful protection of the innocent. And yet, speculations about the destiny of souls and the misapprehension of the nature of Christian duty have resulted in the error of pacifism. Contemporary pacifist spokesman Myron Augsburger says, for example, Can one participate in war and take the life of a person for whom Christ died, when our basic mission as Christians is to win that person to become a brother or sister in the Lord? We cannot kill a person for whom he died and rob him or her of the privilege of knowing the fullness of life that Jesus Christ offers. From an evangelistic perspective, it may be said that whenever a Christian participates in war, he has abdicated his responsibility to the greater calling of proclamation and missions. We disagree with the contention that forceful defense of the innocent must be abandoned in the name of an alleged higher calling of evangelism. Such an evangelism principle must not supersede the more primary duty of man on earth, which the Westminster Confession succinctly states to be to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And yet even the evangelism priority tends to overlook the evangelism of the victims. Any interest on the part of pacifists in forcefully saving those Jews from the Nazis in order to evangelize them? And is there any interest in the evangelism of the womb-inhabiting child who must be kept alive before he can be evangelized? The purported evangelism priority breaks down. God is not glorified by the neglect of deeds of mercy in the name of evangelism or Christian love. Moreover, the measurement of someone's love is a function of the recipient of that love. Were the unborn to assess the love shown by his would-be protectors, we suspect he would give a higher evaluation to the one willing to use any means necessary to defend him. As we indicated above, there are those non-pacifists, those in support of participation in just national wars, who might well erroneously oppose the use of force by private citizens. Force, which may be legitimately wielded by the state, goes the argument, does not necessarily belong to the individual. This argument fails from lack of support. The distinct role of the state is the administration of punishment against evildoers. Romans 13.4. But the duty to defend an innocent person rests with anyone who is standing by. Force is not the exclusive province of the government. Nevertheless, there are biblical texts on which the pacifist builds his case. The same texts are adduced by those who oppose the use of force to stop abortion on ethical grounds. We shall examine the Sermon on the Mount and several other texts in order to discover the light which they properly shed on the subject of godly force. The Sermon on the Mount. Vengeance has its rightful place. According to God, it is wielded properly by himself and those to whom he delegates the job. It is certainly due upon all unforgiven sinners on Judgment Day, and prior to that day upon earthly offenders following judicial process. Despite the rightness of vengeance, however, there are wrong attitudes regularly associated with it.
We mustn't confuse attitudes with actions. One can perform an act of good with an evil attitude, and conversely, do evil with a right attitude. Acts of force need not be misconstrued as vengeful. Vengeance must not be confused with protection. Forceful deeds are not necessarily wrong. Regardless of the goodness or evil of a given deed, attitude is a separate issue. Much of the opposition to the principle of godly force comes from a misunderstanding of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Luke 6, 17 through 49. Misinterpretation of it has produced opposition, not only to war and oaths as one finds in the Anabaptist tradition, but radical opposition to divorce, chapter 5, 32, and capital punishment, chapter 5, 38. There are those who will not seek justice in the courts, 541, or provide for themselves any financial savings, 6, 19, and 20. Some feel obligated to give money to begging derelicts, chapter 5, verse 42, and never to judge anyone's sin, chapter 7, verse 1. Judging by the numbers of professing Christians who remain uncommitted to churches, one might suspect some kind of aversion to public prayers offered up during the service. Quote, when you pray, go to your inner room. Chapter 6, verse 6. Oh, the folly of taking literally what Christ intended figuratively. See John 2, 19, John 20, John chapter 3, verse 3, chapter 4, 4 verse 10, 11, 32, 33, chapter 6, 51, 52, 11, 11 through 13, and John chapter 14, 4 through 6. Most interesting and horrifying is the kind of story one reads in the news every decade or so about someone in earnest who feels compelled to obey the command to pluck out some recalcitrant right eye to prevent its improper outscoping. An Associated Press story reported on August 10, 1993 in the Washington Times recounts the request of Richard K. Cox for a castration. The inmate of Buckingham Correctional Center in Norfolk was convicted of exposing himself to children and wishes to, quote, get closer to his creator. He wants to be castrated not only for the sake of preventing offenses, but for the sake of my own spiritual growth and salvation. So how is one to properly interpret the sermon? It should be understood from the start that a wooden interpretation of the sermon immediately presents a problem of contradiction with the rest of the New Testament, not to mention the rest of Scripture. Paul gives abandonment as a grounds for divorce, in conflict with the sermon's sole ground of fornication. Matthew 5.32, 1 Corinthians 7.15. Jesus conflicts with his own sermon regarding oaths. 5.34, and 26, 63, and 64. John instructs to kick out the false teachers rather than show hospitality. 2 John 10. Matthew 5, 42. Jesus says, judge not one another, while Paul says to judge those within the church. Matthew 7, 1. 1 Corinthians 5, 12. The sermon speaks against all litigation. Chapter 5, verse 41. But Paul only opposes litigation between Christians, 1 Corinthians 6, 4, and 5. Prayers are to be offered up in secret according to the sermon, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. But in the rest of the New Testament, we read about public prayers. See 1 Corinthians 11, 4, and 5. Harmony between the sermon and the rest of the scriptures comes by recognition of the style Jesus is speaking in. He was attempting to break through all the bad doctrine which had attached itself to the words of Scripture. He used the technique of hyperbole to do this. He overstated his points to knock the truth loose from the grip of false teaching. If your eye offend you, pluck it out. Pharisaic interpretation of the Scriptures involved an elaborate effort to set up means of making oneself righteous through the law. See Romans 10:3. It confused rabbinical interpretations with the scriptures themselves.
The Pharisaic theory of tradition was that these additions to the written law and interpretations of it had been given by Moses to the elders and by them had been transmitted orally down through the ages. The classic passage in the Mishnah explains, Moses received the oral law from Sinai and delivered it to Joshua and Joshua to the elders and the elders to the prophets and the prophets to the men of the great synagogue. Interpretive additions often served the purpose of lightening the effects of previously added traditions in order to enable followers to satisfy the demands of the law tradition. For example, a person was permitted to go much further than a Sabbath day's journey if at some time previous he had deposited within the legal Sabbath day journey of the place he wished it to reach bread and water. The great defect of Pharisaism was that it made sin a purely external matter. An act was right or wrong based upon whether some external condition was present or absent. Thus, there was a difference in bestowing alms on the Sabbath, according to whether the beggar put his hand within the door of the donor, or the donor stretched his hand beyond his own threshold. In his sermon, Jesus accomplishes two things. He separates the traditions and interpretations of the Pharisees from the law itself, and he shifts attention from external to internal issues. He brings to his listeners the central issue of attitude. By the use of hyperbole, Jesus overstates his points to jolt his listeners into giving their attention to an interpretation other than what they are used to. You have heard it said, but I say unto you. It is not uncommon in other scripture passages for Jesus to use hyperbole to communicate his message. For example, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. John 14:14. 14, 14. Point? Not you can get whatever you want, write up your Christmas list. Rather, you aren't dealing with a regular guy, but with him who is one with the Father. Another example, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, man against his father. Matthew 10, 34. Point? Not, I hate families and I want to break them up and cause them to hate each other. Rather, following me is serious. It is top priority. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wants to extricate the truth of the law from the traditions which have entangled and smothered it. Calvin's comments, Matthew 5, 20 and 21, are helpful here. He turns against the scribes who struggled to besmear the teaching of the gospel as playing havoc with the law. He restores the law to its purity by ridding it of their degraded comments. Christ had not the least intention of making any change or innovation in the precepts of the law. God there appointed once and for all a rule of life, which he will never repent of. But with the law overlaid with extraneous commentaries and distorted out of its proper intention, Christ champions it from out of the hold of all these excrescences and demonstrates its true purpose from which the Jews had departed. Along with his clarification of the true law, Christ addresses the attitudes of those who would be true followers of God. He points to the sinful attitude of hatred and lust, which bring forth the unlawful acts of murder and adultery. He also addresses the prideful and deceitful attitudes which may produce technically lawful deeds, namely public prayers and oaths. With regard to the current controversy over the issue of force to stop acts of abortion, there appear to be three prescriptions from the Sermon on the Mount which are taken out of context to argue against the godly use of force. The first of these is the admonition to restrain oneself from acts of vengeance. You've heard it said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, Matthew 5.38. It continues on with that famous passage about turning, quote, the other cheek. From this example, the pacifist argues that Christians should not use force to resist harm which evildoers would perpetrate against the innocent. The point of the sermon is missed. Jesus is not instructing against self-defense or the defense of others. That doctrine would conflict with the rest of Scripture. See Exodus 2.12, Exodus 22.2. Rather, he is clarifying the law and extricating it from the traditional interpretation.
Vengeance belongs to God and to whomever he delegates it, e.g. civil authorities, see Romans 13. Jesus confronts the attitude of retaliation, which dominates the unregenerate man. The biblical lex talionis, law of retaliation, is not abrogated. It is just and good. It is that which a righteous judge would exact from offenders. But the dominant disposition of the offended citizen is not to be one of retaliation, but of forgiveness, of turning the other cheek. Further, the passage speaks to the response of the individual towards injury done to himself by another. The individual may and should exercise humility in the face of injustice thrown upon him, but this is not to be mistaken for liberty to ignore or tolerate injustice to another. Jesus, in addressing the abuses of the law, was not reversing the principles set forth in the Old Testament. The eye-for-eye eye principle is demonstrated in three separate books, Exodus, Leviticus, and, De and Deuteronomy. Cumulatively, the references indicate something of God's character and his standard for justice. In the first instance, the people to be protected and vindicated are those born prematurely as the result of malicious injury, Exodus 20, 22. In the second instance, we are told that if malicious injury or death occurs to any human being, the standard of retribution is that, quote, as he has injured the other, so he is to be injured, Leviticus 24, 17 through 20. And in the third instance, we are directed to punish a, quote, malicious witness, a liar, if you will, by meeting out to him the type of punishment that this false witness would have brought to bear against the one he testifies against. Deuteronomy 19, 21. God does not have separate standards of justice for different people groups. All are to be treated alike. All are to be protected equally, including the unborn. It is a principle that is summed up by Jesus in the New Testament when he commands, Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6.31 In fact, according to the words of Messiah, it is this principle that is to be applied equally, which, quote, sums up the law and the prophets. Matthew 7.12 We have said that there are three areas at issue in the Sermon on the Mount, However, we mention the last two only briefly. They are the injunction to love our enemies and to avoid judging others. Matthew 6, 27, 37. By citing these passages, those who wish to craft a theology of pacifism with regard to a Christian response to abortion torture scripture. We are not commanded to turn a blind eye to injustice out of some misguided notion of love for the sinner. We think that justice is of benefit both to him who is relieved of persecution and to him who has fallen into sin. And the admonition to suspend judgment of another does not relate to the individual or civil right to render justice under the law. Rather, it speaks to the attitude of heart that causes one to think self-righteously of himself while seeing others as of less importance.